So on our Thursday podcast, we actually started talking about dating, which if you've missed it, go back and listen to it because my childhood stories of dating are well worth the embarrassment that it causes me. But I forgot to ask you something that I think is very important in dating. And, and you had alluded to the fact that you should be yourself, you should be authentic. But did you ever just bold face lie to someone fully knowing that it was going to come back at some point in time, but that you you just said it in the moment because you you wanted to say it to appease the other person or to maybe will yourself into believing it? You mean in a dating scenario? Yeah. Like you, you kind of knew the person, didn't really know the person, could be second, third date type stuff. And you said something and in the moment you're like, oh God, that is not remotely true. And this is going to come back to bite me in the butt. Oh no, I, I don't think so. Really? I mean, like, let me think, you know, like, okay, when I was first out of college and I was assistant buyer, I probably would have just said I was an assistant buyer. I mean, I'm trying to think like, I wouldn't have lied about me. I might've embellished a job. Oh, I'm an executive assistant to a vice president, which that was actually my title, right? Well, how is that an embellishment then? I know. I can't think of, uh, let me go through people. I mean, there's a lot of them. I might, <laughs> I might not have made my mom sound quite like her real self, but no, no. So maybe you fibbed a bit about Barbara. I probably didn't disclose all of Barbara in the beginning of a relationship. Fair. Yeah. Fair and safe. Fair and safe. But no, you mean like saying like, like I either made more money or I traveled or I was. Or that somebody was like, hey, would, Deb, let's go watch the Seahawks play. And you're like, oh, I'm a huge Seahawks fan. Love number five, nine. Yeah. I wouldn't have said that. No, you would have just. Well, because I really wasn't a Seahawks fan. I was a university of Washington fan. Just an example, Deborah. Clearly. Oh, okay. Um, I feel like you're going to get caught in that stuff really bad. So I had one time where I fibbed <laughs> and, uh, this girl was drop dead gorgeous. Tell us what age you were when this happened. 24. Oh, young. 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 Okay. So, Stupid. Lying made sense <laughs> Stupid, then. Stupid, yeah. Drop dead gorgeous by every metric known to man. Put her in front of a thousand men and a thousand men tell you she is drop dead gorgeous. Doesn't matter. Okay. Personality too. Phenomenal. Yeah. And I can remember going places with her. She would go to the bathroom and guys would come up to me and be like, that's one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen in my entire life. And I'm like, ha thanks. I don't really know how to respond to that. At 24. I, I yeah. lied to her. I, great. I don't know. And I can remember in like the second or third date, and we never ever became boyfriend and girlfriend. She said, you know, I'm not really a big PDA person. Mm. And I was like, yeah, no, 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 me neither. And all I wanted to do was be PDA with this girl. That's right, literally right. all I wanted to do because she was gorgeous. She was drop dead gorgeous. And, and you so, wanted everybody to know she was with you. Of course, because I was 24 and insecure about everything. Right, right. And so we would go on a couple more dates and we would go out and we would go dancing. And I mean, especially if I had a couple of drinks in me, I completely forgot that I had lied and said like, oh yeah, PDAs, bleh, whatever, those are stupid, right? And I'm sure I was just like glomming on to her in right. the inappropriate drunk and 24-year-old way to where she eventually said, do you remember when I told you I wasn't really big on PDAs? I said, yeah. She goes, I think you are. Oh, that's a great way to say it though. And I was like, yeah, I guess so. I think you're right. <laughs> and it, I don't know that that was the reason that we broke up. I mean, I think we broke up because I was an idiot and I just Because was she was 24. creeped out by you a little bit? Sure. And she was, the other thing is she was like 22 going on 30 professionally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was 24 reverting to 16. <laughs> so that was just a mismatch in and of itself. But that was really the only time I had over exaggerated or under exaggerated, mm -hmm. depending on which side of the fence you fall on. Something that was very clear to her that that was like a thing that she didn't want to cross. That was a, a, an element of a boundary. And I was just like, but I can't not with you. You're just so Beautiful. Do you know, who, do I know who this girl is? Of course. I can't think of who it might be, but let me say this. We can talk about it off air. Well, but let me say this. Sure. Did you meet her with your friend, Matt? 
Yes. Okay, then I know who it is. Makes uh, all the sense in the world, right? <laughs> makes all the sense in the world. That girl was just out of your league. Oh, my God. Time. In every yeah. conceivable of, way. Yeah, like, you literally were, it was like somebody from the Little Leagues went up to the majors. Is I was, was. If, if you can just picture this analogy yeah. of people who are like spinning plates, but yeah. who don't know how to spin plates, yeah. okay? Somehow I blacked out. I got all the plates spinning. Yeah. No idea how I did it. No idea how I got there. And then the the rest of the time was me trying to think, remember, figure out why these plates were spinning. How yeah, did I yeah. get to this point where this person was like, yeah, I'll go on multiple dates with you. And I actually enjoy spending time with you. And I'm just like looking over my shoulder being like, you're me, right? You're, you you want to spend time with me? I'm but, stupid. <laughs> but here's, <laughs> yes, that's true. I'm an idiot. But here's the thing that I would say if if somebody said to me, generally speaking, are you a PDA person? I would say absolutely not. Me? Yes. No. You're not. She made me one. <laughs> she made me want to become one to the point that I think in the moment when I said it, it was true. And then because she was who she was, it was not true. Yeah. You couldn't help yourself. No. Yeah. I was a fat kid in a candy store. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with myself. She was, I remember the first time I laid eyes on her. She was, well, she was, I want to say, smart and nice. Oh, yeah. And However beautiful she was, she was equally, if not more, brilliant and right. polite and yes. generous. All of the things you would hope somebody is. And then like, oh, they're a rock solid 10 too. But she, I can remember we went to lunch and I couldn't take my eyes off of her. Yeah. I was like not listening to you. As you should. She was just, I just was, look, couldn't quit looking at all of her. Yeah, she was gorgeous. And she was super nice. Boy, you blew that. There was only way that was ending, <laughs> that one way that was ending, and it was ending the way that it ended, yeah, which was me being yeah, stupid. Yeah. But yeah, I was thinking about our conversation on Thursday, and I thought, oh, you know, so many people lie in dating, and yeah. I wonder if Deb ever lied. And that's really the only thing I have ever been aware of that I embellished to the point and then was like, Oh, you, there's no way you can walk this back. Here's the way I think girls might lie that isn't a lie lie, but has some, I'm going to say deception around it. Sure. So you go out, a guy takes you out to dinner, let's say, right? And he orders some, I don't know, some appetizers and then, you know, this giant steak with all the trimmings and everything. Yep. And you go, oh, I'll have a side salad, right? I mean. The girl? The girl. Oh, yeah. Eat. Total. Because Please eat. We do eat, right? I mean, but we're just not eating in front of you, right? Which is like, I would have somebody to believe that I only lived on side salads. Yeah. Right? I, I, never, I was, never a whole salad. I, I mean, this conversation can dovetail into what you should and should not eat on right. first dates. Like nobody in their right mind should be slurping spaghetti right. on their right. first date. But I think universally, every guy has respect for a girl who orders an actual meal. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you're like, you know, 4'10", and you weigh 80 pounds, then yeah, you're probably not going to go order the prime we rib. We want every girl to be Bev. We do. We want every girl to, we know you love food. Yeah. We want to love food with you. And we want to watch you eat it and enjoy it. Don't order a side salad. Don't order a side salad. Yeah. Don't lie about PDAs when all you want to do is PDA that person <laughs> all day. Let's start the podcast. Oh, God. Welcome to the Deb and Kev podcast. One is a Harvard Business School alum. The other is her son. Discussing business, pop culture, family, and everything in between. Now, here are your hosts, Deb and Kev. Hey, hi, hello, and welcome to the Deb and Kev pod. Right over there, the number one rider die bad boy for life is my mom, Deb. I'm Deb. And I'm the Martin Lawrence to her Will Smith. I'm Kev. Oh, thank goodness. And this is our Monday <laughs> podcast. Tangent, I am starting to like just think of bizarre ways to open the show. And I saw a commercial for a bad boys weekend. Yep. I think I there's only two. three. And this is what came to my mind and when, when I wrote this. When I saw it, I looked at both of them and I went, you know, I would be really sad to be the Martin Lawrence of those two. I definitely want to be the Will Smith. So thank you, Kevin. Anyways, on today's show, <laughs> Deb will uh, get very businessy with us as she's going to get into the importance 
of P&Ls. And for those of you who don't know, that's profit and loss statements, people. Okay? And this could apply, I do want to say, this could apply to people's personal lives. So even Ooh. if you're not a business owner, as I talk about this and kind of tell these stories, think about it with your own income and your own life. We call those PP&Ls, personal profits and losses. Oh, there you go, Kev. Coined I like that. that. We are also going to tee up a bunch of Deb-specific would-you-rathers. It's actually been a while since we've played that, I so like I'm excited for that. And then we will wind it all up with what we are thankful for this week, as well as what is for dinner. But first, but first, but first, this is the but first before the normal but first. We talked about who shaves people at the hospital last week. And we just kind of left it with an ellipsis. We didn't really know. A lot of people have an opinion and lots <laughs> of people of have people. a knowledge about who shaves people in hospitals. And more nurses than we knew listen to the podcast. The amount of educated people that listen to this podcast compared to the stupidity on this side of the podcast <laughs> <Yeah>. is alarming. <laughs> we have way too many doctors, way too many nurses, way too many successful people who listen to us. And as seen by the cold open, I'm not that. I'm Martin Lawrence. But so we have, we figured out that it is nurses that shave people. Yep. We also figured out that nurses apparently do an extremely good job shaving people. So if your biggest worry heading into surgery is, do I shave myself or does somebody else shave me? You have a skilled precision nurse who will leave your inner thigh, groin, buttocks, chest, <laughs> back, just smoother than a baby's backside. And if you don't do it right, she will. Yeah. And we also learned that there is no actual training. They just kind of tell you to go at it and figure it out. True. Right? And we also, uh, we surmised from some of the messages that we got that if it is, I'm just going to call it a personal, private possibly embarrassing area to have shaved, you're probably under when that happens. Wild. Wild. You, you go to sleep and you wake up and <laughs> you're just clean. With a clean shave. Crazy. Yeah. The other thing I want to talk about is I gave you a hard time on your Netflix viewing habits last mm. week. And because karma just looks at Kevin and says, shut up, idiot. Netflix came out with a brand new show that literally has been reviewed to the nth degree and back about being arguably the best show of 2021. I, as, I, as I recall, it's still January. And it's a French-based show called Lupin, L-U-P-I-N. And it's about a very charismatic, very gregarious um, kind of neighborhood thief, if you will. Yeah, And it's his... Um, story about why he stole what he stole and then how he goes about finding out more information as it relates to his personal life. We killed it in a day. And you were mesmerized by it. Well, you were literally in love with the guy. Oh my gosh. He was on screen for maybe five yeah. minutes and you go, wait, who is this guy? I yeah. said, well, this is that show I was telling you about Lupin. You go, is he really speaking French? I said, well, yeah, it's a French show. You're like, Oh my God, if he speaks French, he is perfect. <laughs> exactly. I mean, a guy that looks like that, that either, I mean, can speak English with a French accent for Which all I Which I think care. he can. I have seen him in bit roles, like American roles, because uh -huh. he would look very familiar to me. But yeah, that guy is speaking fluent French. So not only yeah. is he good looking and charismatic and charming, he speaks French. the love language. Yeah. It's, it's so dramatic. Um, I am going to add one thing about Bridgerton that I just read for all those that are watching. Oh, geez. Here we go. So I will only say this, and I will not ruin anything when I say this. However, if everybody that has watched it looks back to the library scene, think stone steps and think a library ladder. We are, we are narrow casting right now. That was the very first scene they shot. Okay, I have no context for that, but if you watch Bridgerton... You'll know, you'll know. Be hyper aware that scene on the steps in front of the library... And the library ladder. And the library ladder. Guys, first that's scene. the first scene they shot. First scene shot ever. Ever. Okay. Speaking of television... Yes. I don't know that you've seen this. This, this has been on my radar for a while now. There is a reality TV show, and I think it's on like... A&E or TLC or 
one of the shows you don't think would run these, but runs shows like this way more than they don't. And it's called, I love a mama's boy. (laughs) And I thought to myself, I thought to myself, cease and desist, cease and desist. This is my lane. Okay. This is Deb and I's area. And here's the little synopsis. What happens when a woman falls in love with a guy who has an overbearing mother? Not that you're that. Four young women vie to become the leading lady in their man's life and hope that these mama's boys will finally cut the cord. I literally just saw the name of the show and burst out laughing the first time Have I saw it. Have you watched any of it? No, but I feel like we need to. We should probably watch it. We should probably review it. But I think like, I think there's, okay, what we think in the traditional mama's boy. Yeah. Like meaning I iron your clothes, I do your laundry. God, I, wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, none of that happens. I give you no. money. I say, here, honey. And know. I would accept all yeah. the money in clean laundry. So there's all that, right? Yep. Um, and then there's like, hey, we just are close. Sure. We fall into the, hey, we're just close. I think both are, could be issues for a partner. Yes, of now, you, now, you have said multiple times to me, maybe on air and off air, that when the time comes for you to hand over the baton to whomever is dumb enough yep. to want to spend the rest of their life with Whoever me. Whoever she is. And assuming I'm in the right frame of mind to say yes to that, you are happy to take a step backwards. Happy. And say, I've done as much as I could with him. Godspeed. Godspeed. I do think our relationship, though, is extremely intimidating to anybody from the outside looking in. Well, I did tell you at one point that if you're dating a girl, I would prefer that you never mention me. I have learned that the hard way multiple times. Don't talk about me. I don't exist. There have been women who actually met you prior to meeting me And they held you in such high esteem that by the time they met me, they were like, I'm not, I don't believe I'm worthy enough to date you to which I'm like, trust me, (laughs) you are. (laughs) But because they held you at such a high pinnacle, they were like, oh, this is not going to go well for me. I think the only way we can do it is that you say nothing about me other than like, hey, she's a nice mom. She loves me. She makes a good stew, you know, things like that. I mean, to not act like you hate me, right? Um, Or I think like I have to go find her first so that she and I can create a thing and then she's cool with you. But there's- You mean you being the impetus for the relationship? Like I'm I'm somehow the matchmaker. Yeah, that's not overbearing at all. (laughs) That's super healthy. I don't know any other way to do it because what ends up happening is- There's a lot of intimidation. But do you think I'm intimidating? Yes. No, to these, do you think I act intimidating? Uh, fair. I don't believe you act intimidating. I think you're extremely welcoming and I think you're extremely willing to let this partner individual prospect be who they need to be in that moment. Right? Yes. I'm sort of shocked by this hesitancy I th- in your voice. I think that I mean, if somebody is watching us right now, Jen Beebe, who is the only one we know really does, I mean like Corey Workman, maybe. I am There's like, like at least ten other people that watch this, okay? Thank you <laughs> okay. guys so much. I am Deb like and Kev crew. Shocked because I think if you're excited about a girl and I haven't met her, I think I'm excited about the girl. I think I'm like I let me just say this. I don't believe this is a specifically Deb thing. Okay. I think anybody who brings anybody to the table the first time, mm-hmm. it's it's met with skepticism. It's always met with skepticism. Nobody is like, I'm just going to love that. I know one person in my life, shout out Aria, who literally, no matter who you are, what you're about, <laughs> if you're new to the group, to the table, to whatever's happening, she's like, let's be best friends. Everybody else, there's just an air of caution. And I do believe you present yourself extremely well. I do believe that you are extremely welcoming. You're hospitable. You try to make a comfortable first interaction, but it, 
But no, I, you're, everybody's judging somebody the first time. I don't know. I we, think we, we took personality tests and one of your <laughs> biggest traits is judging people. Was your, yours too. Same. Okay, so I do remember the first time I laid eyes on your college girlfriend. Yes. She had the, oh my God, the moral fortitude to drive across country with you and John. True. And she jumped out of the car and dad and I were standing on the front porch and she ran and leaped in my arms and said, I am so excited to meet you. And I said, me too. She you. was just happy to see estrogen. And we got along famously and she would have never said any of those things. Now, now that's a great reference because what she did was she zigged when you expected a zag. <laughs> she didn't do the cautiously walk up the steps, let me walk through the door first, introduce her. She just went right to your throat. Exactly. And, I and, loved it. and met you in a place that you in no way expected it to go. Yeah. Which is, I would say, really important for Deb. Well, now, maybe another zig would be like calling you a terrible name right off the bat. And I don't think that would go that as well. That so wouldn't work So when well. you zig, zig towards the positive with you. Zig towards the positive. But I remember the time that she and I went to San Francisco for a few days together. She, we were talking at lunch one day and she was telling me about all of her girlfriends who don't get along with their boyfriends, you know, because mm -hmm. it wasn't really fiancés then, you know, their boyfriends, sure. moms, and that how the girls were like, oh, you know, like, and she said, I just say all the time. I would spend time with Deb morning, noon, and night with or without Kev. And I felt like, was most, I wrong about that? Most all my friends would say the exact same thing. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't wrong. No, I, I. she is absolutely the exception to the majority of the rule, which is she thoroughly enjoyed you. You thoroughly enjoyed her. Whether I was present or not, you both would have found each other in life and hit it off successfully. And I know that there is still a hole in your heart <laughs> where she used to be. <laughs> still a hole in my heart. Um, on the flip side, I will say, and I'll own this, high school girlfriend, you can't speak to her. She can't call here. She can't set foot on our property. Right. She had every reason to hate me. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I, like, I just think that you fall within the norm. I don't, th I don't think you're this, like, stereotypical mother meeting the the girlfriend for the first time who's like arms across and like prove it prove mm -hmm. yourself to me i do believe that exists in the back of your head and is actively working while this is going on and if there are missteps and if there are ums, uhs, buts and if you feel that there's some evasion happening you will happily explore that with a smile on your face and the poor girl will never see it <laughs> coming um but yeah you're extremely nice while you do that Listen, to all the beautiful young women out there, and when I say beautiful, I mean heart and soul, I'm waiting for you. He may not be, <laughs> but I am waiting for you, and I will welcome you all with open arms. So we need to watch I Love a Mama's Boy. Let's watch. Because if yeah. there's way too much overlap, it might be time for me to find my own place. Oh, okay. No, that's never going to happen. Like, <laughs> not I remotely. need you for a while. Yeah, that's never, ever yeah. going to be a real thing. Um so when I think of personal profits and losses, mm -hmm. I think of good girlfriends, bad girlfriends, good interactions, bad interactions, financials, and otherwise. If you start with the fundamentals of a profit and loss, Deb, mm -hmm. what can we glean from this topic today? So at its essence, in its most simple form, a profit and loss tells you whether you're making money or whether you're losing money, okay? Got it. So in its simplest form, it's calculated by totaling all of the business's revenue, you know, from whatever source it comes, and then subtracting from that all of the business's expenses, okay? Got it. That is the most simple way to say it. And hopefully we end up with a plus number. We want to be in the black. We want to be in the black, though many times we're in the red, right? Sure. Amazon, great example, was in the red for like the first 20 years. Exactly. So so they were running, and then people say, how can that be? Because they were running on cash flow. Correct. They had enough cash flow. But they didn't have profit at the end of the year. Correct. So profit and loss statements are always for a period of time. You could look at your P&L once a month. You could look at your P&L once a quarter. 
Hopefully you look at it more than once a year. But the profit and loss statement should designate the time period that you're looking at, right? Got it. So we talked about all of the um, all of the income that comes in. So I'm just going to make up a little company. We're going to call it Larry's Landscaping. Oh, I love Larry's Landscaping. He does a good job, L doesn't he? L squared. L squared. That's my guy. So Larry, we know, probably makes his money doing landscaping. I mean, short of that being a front for something, yes, he is a great landscaper. So that so if Larry comes to our house once a month and mo- or once a week during the summer and mows the lawn, you know, income from us might be two or three hundred dollars a month. We're paying Larry to mow the lawn and trim everything and do that, and then that's repeated many times over for all of his customers. Sure. Then there could be that Larry does fall and spring you know, clean up before winter and then after winter, right? Yep. And so that might be, Larry might want to know, like, how do I just, how much money do I make from the weekly mows and trims and all that? And then how much do I make from the cleanups, you know, the big cleanups? Yep. And then people can just randomly, who don't use Larry, call and say, we need some yard work done. Come on in. It might last a couple days. Then in the winter time, Larry might want to expand his business and he and his guys put up Christmas lights for you and take them down. I love Larry for his all in one service. So Larry's got a lot. Larry is also going to fix our sprinklers if they go wrong. Wow. Right. He's going to take care of everything. So if I'm Larry, I can literally for the money that I make, it can just be, let's just say, call it a hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Okay. But if I only have $100,000 without any detail on it, what I don't know is how much I make on the weekly mows, how much do I make on the spring and fall cleanups versus the weekly mows, how much do I make, am I making good money on the Christmas tree lights, right? I mean, so I kind of want it divided up where there's that $100,000. I also want to know how much I'm bringing in in each section. And why do you want it divided up per service? I want it divided up because I can really determine whether or not it's a profitable service. Got it. Because often we offer something that we think we're doing well with, but it's, it's just not making money for us. Now, it's okay if it's not like, let's say the Christmas tree lights. Let's say they're a break even. But if the Christmas tree lights keep his guys employed in the winter, right, and keep a paycheck in their hands and keep people forefront, you know, Larry and his landscaping crew are forefront in their mind at a time when people wouldn't be thinking of him, then Larry might say breaking even is good enough for that, right? But at least he has all the details. If Larry knows for sure that his biggest profit is in the weekly mows, right? That that's where he makes the most money. Then that's the area he's always going to want to keep growing in. I mean, because he knows that's easy. So it's not just having that $100,000 number. It's then having the details of that $100,000 number. Okay. Yep. So on the expense side, you know, we can just go through Larry's business checkbook or his QuickBooks and just add up all the expenses. And let's say again, it's $100,000, right? So on the expense side, what Larry would have to look at is how much is he paying in labor? How much is he paying in, like if he has a rental place to put all of his equipment, right? How much is he paying for insurance? How much is he paying for benefits? I mean, just every single expense, right? And so the reason we want to see all that is because what do we want to do with expenses? The other way to make money is to cut back on expenses. And if they're not itemized, and if we don't have the specifics about all of them, then we can't make a well-informed decision as to what to cut or what not to cut. The example I just used, Larry brought in $100,000 and Larry spent $100,000. So there was no additional profit at the end of the year. And there are businesses that can go on like that forever because everybody's getting a paycheck. Everything's being paid for. But at some point, the problem with that is let's say that 10 of Larry's lawnmowers break all at the same time. Right. Does Larry have the funding to go get the new lawnmowers, right? right? So then it's like, what do we need to create that kind of thing? Or if Larry says, I'm really paying too much for that giant 
warehouse where all my stuff is. I think I could actually buy some land and build one on the outskirts of town and it would be easy enough, right? And then I've invested in land, I've invested in real estate. That's what I want to do. Where are we going to get that money from? And so we have the P&L to look at where we can potentially get that money from. Got Does it. that make sense? Yep. So people can sit down and I mean, I've had people just say, I'll say like, are you making money? And they'll say yes. And they literally just look at their um, income, add it all up. And then they look at their expenses, add it all up and they subtract it. Okay. Yes, I'm making money. That number is in the positive. It's in the black. All right. The problem with that is we don't really know if it's a healthy business with just that information. I mean, good news. Yes. Right. That right. it's not in the red. But we don't know how much opportunity we have in that business without all of the detail. And I think sometimes people like to skip over the detail and don't assess the detail in, I'm going to say, their operational goals. Do you know what I mean? That, they, that they've set, right? Okay. So, yes, it could be a very simple formula. But the simple formula in the end actually doesn't tell us much at all. Sure, it's too broad. It's too broad. Yeah. So what people should do is they should have all the right ca uh, categories for their business. Um, I do think it's important. Like I make money from different sources, yep. right? And so for me, I like each of them. I want each of them to be profitable. You know, I mean, to be standalone, profitable. Sure. That's a big deal to me. Yep. I don't want one to carry the other because if that happens for me, it means I'm just giving away my time. So for me, it would be mandatory, you know, that each silo, if you will, would be a profit center. Correct. Okay. Um, you and I are really lucky because the kind of business we're in, we don't have a lot of outstanding expenses sure. because our expenses are normally reimbursed. True. Sure. Right. Um, so we create them, but then we get reimbursed for them. So we're on a P&L, we're kind of a simple business. If yes, you will. very. But I still think we have to show as much detail as possible so that we know where we're spending our time and was my goal to make this much per project, per hour, per whatever, and did I accomplish that, right? Sure. Certainly in something that has a cost of goods, you know, or a real professional service, but like Larry has a cost of goods. I mean, he isn't maybe selling, he's selling beautiful lawns, right? But he probably also has to buy sprinkler parts, you know, and fix the sprinkler and pass that cost on. You know, certainly um, there's inventory for him with all of the equipment that he has. That's part of the thing and how it's going to be depreciated. So we need to know how that works. And I just think like, I think people think a P&L is very, very simple. But hear me when I say a very, very simple P&L is just completely ineffective to accomplish what it is you're setting out to accomplish. Oftentimes people do P&Ls at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And that's 12 months worth of information that even if you've been Johnny on the spot with everything is still a lot to decompress. Well, if they're doing their QuickBooks or something like that, and they're keeping that up to date, they should be able to produce a P&L at any time. Sure. But uh, most times I feel like people wait till the end of the year just to see how they're doing. And people get backed up with QuickBooks and all of that. Yeah. Is there a recommendation for you, from you, to where, hey, look at it once a month, look at it once a quarter, have a, have a, a, full understanding of where you're at in a certain time frame, so that, I mean, because where you're at Jan 1 is certainly not where you could be at December 31st. So here's the thing, if you look at it once a month, right? And I'm not saying that you have to spend a full day on this at all. I'm just saying there are seasonal trends to your business. Now, the most obvious we would say is retail at Christmas, right? Sure. But every business, every business has trends depending on what is going on. And that doesn't mean it's Thanksgiving or Christmas. Okay. But depends on what's going on in that industry. It could be a business that does better in the winter than the summer and vice versa, where it's really a summer focused business. Yep. And so what we want to be able to know and develop is those, see those trends, 
because that's where our opportunity lies or not, right? Totally. And if you're not looking at it once a month, then stuff is happening behind you in arrears. And in order to really do something with it, then often you have to wait until next year. So I just think, I think printing one, I just think there's a lot of reporting is very is easy. I mean, I think this about AR reports too. Just print one once a month, go over it with whoever you need to go over it with on your team, take a look at it, see if you see any trends, see if things are up, see if things are down. No cause for big, re, big you know, changes, but it does help you react in the moment rather than waiting to get, waiting to get away from you. And then your chance to react is really gone. I know what an AR is, but for those who don't, why don't you go ahead and explain that to them? Accounts receivable is actually considered when it's on an AR report, when it's considered an accounts receivable, it's actually considered an asset to your company, but it's an asset that is not yet paid. You haven't gotten paid. You've done the work, they've bought the thing, but you haven't gotten paid yet. And so an AR is aged like one to 30 days, 30 to 60, 60 to 90. And for different businesses, there's different formulas of how fast or how slow they should age. What we want is those assets turned into cash, right? right. Obviously, everybody to pay us what they owe us. Um, that doesn't always happen if you're willing True. to carry, you know, debt for people. And so then, you know, they can become a loss if you can never collect that money. But it lets you know where your money is according to the service or work you've done. Is it in your pocket? Is it in your bank? Or is it still with them at 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 120 days. That's probably, I mean, just the super simple, you know. I feel like I know what you're going to say, but if you were to emphasize the biggest point about a profit and loss statement and how it can be useful both in your personal life and in your professional life, I mean, it has to exist in your professional life, but it can certainly be transported over to your personal life. What is its number one objective? The number one objective is to showing you where your money's come coming from and where it's going. So I'll give you an example. Um, you know, dad and I helped somebody do a budget. This is a number of years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Who said I need a budget. And um, a lot of people don't realize that on their checking accounts, you can go in on your checking account and it will categorize things where you're spending it, you know, like clothing stores, uh, entertainment, food, you mean drinks, whatever, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so when we were helping this person, I remember dad said to her, um, because she said, I only pay this much in rent and I, I've had a car for a while, you know, it's all paid for. And he said, well, did you mean to spend 65 of your in 65% of your income at restaurants and bars? <laughs> and she was like, no. And he goes, well, that's what's happening. Right. And that's exactly what a PL would show you about your business, Right. I mean, there are percentages that are just guidelines of what we should be spending for rent or lease or mortgage or whatever it is. There are percentages that we should be spending on marketing. There are percentages we should be spending on salaries, you know, depending on the size of our business. And what that stuff does is when we stop and take a look at it, we can see if we're edging to a place that isn't good, right? Or, I mean, do we really intend to spend 65% of our income? A restaurant and bars. Not right now we don't. Not right now we don't. <laughs> um, and I don't think our friend that was doing that is doing that right now either. True. But um, I think like that was, I remember that being shocking to her. Like that just felt like, you know, it felt wrong to her, you know, at the time. And then we said, well, how much are you willing to spend? And then that becomes the same question for the business owner. You know, in a perfect world, what would you like this to be? And do you have any influence in driving the cost of goods down? And if you bought a little bit more in bulk, would it actually save you money here? I mean, there's a million questions you can ask yourself, right? It's clarity. It's a and l offers you transparency and clarity. And assuming you've loaded all the proper numbers and you've, yep. and you've stayed up to date on it, it lets you know exactly how your business is functioning and does not have emotion behind it. It exactly. is what is good, what is bad, where you need to shore up and when and where everything is a-okay. Exactly, exactly. And I know it's kind of like, you know, people who don't want to look in their bank account and see how much is there, right? Sure. I mean, better to know than not, 
I guess. <laughs> and um, that's the thing with the PNL. Better to know. Let me throw a one minute hypothetical at you. It's been a while since we've done this. <sighs> okay. So let's see if you are still as sharp as ever. <laughs> say you're a partner in a business or say you're interested in purchasing another business. Okay. okay? You've had some talks with the individual and the next stage is paperwork. Yeah. And they provide you a, a P&L that let's just say is like totally bare bones. Just like, this is what we made. This is what we spent money on. And here's the difference. Like four lines. Okay. What do you do? And they gave that to me? That was when you asked for a P&L, that's what they provide you. This is not like a 10 page document. This is a single page document that has five lines of information on it. Hmm. Now remember, one minute hypothetical works like this. I just come up with this idea. I give it to Deb. Deb can ask me three qualifying questions and then we're gonna time her for a minute. Knowing Deb, she's probably not gonna need a minute for this, but you still have your questions. My first question is, do we have a bleep thing? Oh, I don't think so. I don't think that that exists on this board. I would say I could add it in post, but then that would make me do more work, which I'm not super keen okay, on. Okay, then I think if I, that's what's literally what somebody gave me. Yeah. I'm just. I'm Are gonna, you starting right now? Well, no, I'm not starting okay. yet. Okay. Because I asked the question that I didn't get an answer to. Or, do you, do we have a bleep button? Yeah. No, we don't. Okay. Uh, which I should program on here. That's hilarious. Okay, you should pro program a bleep. Because right now I want to say something has a bleep on it, Got right? It. Um, okay, like... Do we feel like these are smart people that have the information and haven't given us, or do we just feel like we're dealing with a bunch of dummies who don't know? They would want you to believe they're super. Yeah, they would. They would want you to believe they're super smart. Right. But based on the fact that you asked for a P and L and this is what they gave you, maybe this is more of an indicator as to who they really are. So I'm going to lean into either big dummies or sneaky people. Okay. Okay. That is your prerogative based on the information I'm giving you? Yeah. Uh, Are these people, if I ask for information, will they give it to me? Eventually. Okay. In in whatever way they interpret the information, I think you'll, you'll receive, you'll receive it from their end and it might not be ideal for you. I'm just trying to get into the nuts and bolts of where you press where you back off and how a, a P&L can be a great indicator as um, to the substance or lack thereof of a business that you're looking to purchase. Yeah. So probably what I would say. Starting? Starting. Got it. Uh, when I first got it, I would probably say, holy bleep, where's the rest of it? Got At it. At least to myself. Yep. Right? Makes sense. And then I would probably go back to them and say, hey, thanks for this P&L, but here's let me show you Larry's landscaping. That's the kind of PL I really need. Larry's right? the best. Larry's the best. And then I would probably say, I also need a copy of the tax returns, right? I also need access to the QuickBooks. And that if you're going to sell a business, what we're really doing, and I'll happily sign, you know, a non disclosure, um, but we have to share all the information so that I am very clear on what I'm buying. And that this in and of itself is not, n- not even kind of not nearly, it's nothing. I mean, and I mean, it's like, trust me, it really is when they, somebody does that. Sure. It's like, trust me. And then I guess the snarky side of me would want to say like, Hey, do you know about business math? Can I help <laughs> you with that? Do you know what I mean? Sure. But, um, you have to go back and ask for the rest of the information. Yeah, for sure. So essentially what you're saying is the P and L. And the lack of detail can be the canary in the coal mine that you're either dealing with less than reputable people or they genuinely don't understand how a business operates. Right. Because, and some of it really is people just don't understand and they haven't done a good job, you know, for themselves. And that's why you don't want to go back. I mean, you want to keep your holy bleep to yourself. Got it. And you want to go back and say, hey, thanks, but I'm going to need some more. Got it. If I'm going to entertain this. Yep. Um, But I do think, you know, it would kind of be like me. I mean, that's almost akin to me writing it down on a napkin saying, hey, (sighs) my business made 500. I took in $500,000. I had $100,000 in expenses, $400,000 left. I want $800,000 for my business. There you go. I mean, you've got to give, you've got to be willing to share a lot more than that. Good 
to know. Anything else? No, I think I'm good. Wonderful. Let's get into Would You Rather. Let's do it. I'm excited for this because I used some um, stuff that I found on the internet, but then I catered it to you. Okay. And of course, Would You Rathers are at their most fun when you ask qualifying questions and we can get into the minutia of one option or the other. So by all means, don't feel like you just need to immediately respond. You can ask questions. This is the fun of Would You Rathers, and we have not done this for the for a while, so I'm excited. Here you go. Would you rather number one? Okay. Would you rather, and that means you, you me, Depp. Me. Would you rather be able to talk with your dog or would you rather that your dog live as long as you live? Oh, you mean that my dog could talk to me? You're, you. So we have two dogs. Right. We have Izzy and we have Nola. Yeah. You have the ability to, whether through ESP or verbal, speak yeah. to those dogs. They speak back to you so you know exactly what they want and what they're saying. Yeah. Or yeah. they will live with you for as long as you live. Oh, that's really hard. I know. That's why this is, would you rather? Um, my first inclination is to say, oh, to be able to talk to your dog would be the most amazing thing in the world. And why is that? I don't know, but I would know, like, if she said to me, you know that thing you do behind my ears, I actually hate it. Yeah. And then I would go, but you always make like little cute noises when I do it. And then she would go, it's actually noises of pain. I hate it, right? I mean, like, wouldn't you love to know that? So I think we automatically assume that the dogs are putting like coherent English together right. and saying something like, Deborah, it's me, Izzy, your dog. When you approach me the way you do and <laughs> start scratching my ears in that general area right. that you scratch them, I don't enjoy that very much. Right, right. Can we please have an agreement that you won't do that unless you ask my permission? I think if you were to actually talk to the dogs, just based on how dogs talk, right. they'd be like, stop. <laughs> Oh, you don't think I'm going to have a deep, meaningful conversation with the dog? I think it, the, the reality has to be based on how much dogs know of the English okay. language. And it's something like dogs can learn like 50 different... 200 words. Oh, 200. There mm -hmm. you go. So they can know 200 words and the meaning behind those words. That's still extremely limited compared to what we know. So if I put that caveat on it, which is you can speak to your dog, but they only know... 200 general words of English, yeah. does that change your your thought yeah. behind that? Yeah. That changes a little food bit. Food now. It fe yeah, food now. It also feels like it's extremely selfish of me. I'm looking at our two dogs up there. <sighs> it also feels like it's extremely selfish of me to not let them live. I mean, it, like, we, we, Blossom lived for 16 years, True. right? I mean, Izzy is now almost 12, I think she's almost 13. Is she? Yeah. Um, so as long as they were healthy and happy, not, you know, like decrepit, you know. I mean, I, the way I think about it is, does a dog really want to be alive for 35 more years? As long years? as they feel good. But like, at what point does the dog just come to the realization like, this is it? This is my life? Dogs have happy lives. Do they? No, they, they have do. happy lives in twelve year increments. Yeah. But like, if you quadruple that, they're like, "What is this life?" Wait, okay, you don't think Nola and Izzy are very, very different? A thousand percent. But you don't think both Nola and Izzy would be happy to do the things they do every day with you forever? No, I think they'd both rather just run outside. All day long by themselves. And then after Free. five years, they could find somebody else and be happy with that person yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. The talking thing would be really cool, but, you know, I do love Izzy. I'd do the talking thing. Would you do the talking I, thing? Because yeah. even though, I mean, and we've seen that crazy poodle who, like, presses the buttons presses and says, like, buttons. food and all that stuff. Yeah, like, where, dad. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so cool. Yeah. And even though you could say, well, that's the workaround, get the button thing. I would love to know the dog's voice. I would, I yeah. mean, 200 is some, a small amount of information now, 200 words, but I feel like you could understand them better. Like we know our dog's personalities, but if they could actually vocalize it, you would get them even better. I think Izzy would be extremely sarcastic oh, as a dog. Izzy would be awful and I, in a And I way. just love the idea that we all 
believe we know what our dog's personalities are, but if we could right. hear them and then truly understand what their personalities are, it would be the, it would be the best 12 years ever. So, like, how many words does a two-year-old have, I wonder? I don't know. They're stupid. I mean, like, we just have to compare it to something like that, right? Because it ends up starting with just words, not sentences. I, I would say it'd be more like three years old. Three years like old? Like a three-year-old, but you can understand them and they know what they're, they're yeah. talking about. So that's that one. Okay. What did you pick? I'm going to pick talk. Talk? I think that's the right yeah. choice. Oh, this is a funny one. I don't even know why I put this one on here. Would you rather, and this doesn't have to apply to dad, would you rather your significant other never flush the toilet after <laughs> any kind of use? Oh, my God. Or would you rather they have bad breath? Not like horrible halitosis breath, like awful, like your eyes are watering, don't get within 10 feet of me, but like there's always just a little funk in the air. Never flushes the toilet. Never. Number one, number two, number three, four, five, or six. <laughs> oh it always Lord. just sits. And waits for somebody else to flush it. Correct. So so it might be you. It might be a guest. I know. Well, he, he can never go to the bathroom downstairs. I mean, that would have to be a rule if this is the option you chose. That he has to go pick a bedroom to use to go to the bathroom. But then that's your bedroom. And so or yours. Yeah, my, I'm going to lock and key my room. <laughs> uh, oh, man, that is a good one. Thank you. But you know, the thing is, you and I both know, God rest her soul, somebody who had, like, you could stand five feet away. I'm not talking about that bad. Oh. That is, that is off, like, feel bad for the person. <laughs> yeah, bad it breath. Was bad. Like, there's nothing science Kinda could like do. Kind of like morning breath. Can we call it morning Great. breath? Or like we just ate a lot of garlic. I'm gonna go but it's with, perpetual. I'm gonna go with the breath. And you think you're just gonna Stockholmian syndrome that just get used to it? I think I'm just gonna get used to it. And in the back of tickle of my mind, I'm gonna say, remember when he had the flu and kept throwing up and throwing up and had diarrhea? Like, nope, I think I'm good. I can't do bad breath. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it. I don't think I you can flush the toilet either. Do it. I don't think you can flush the toilet. I think I want to say that the toilet seat is up when you walk in. I think you can become immune to that. And I think the majority of the time it's one more so than two. And I think you're just like, every time I come in here, I'm just going to expect to have to do a pre-flush. The bad breath would be an assault on me. What if he went to the bathroom like three or four times before you got in there? And it just piled up. I'll call the plumber. <laughs> Hopefully he goes to a bunch of different toilets. Oh. I don't, I couldn't do the bad breath. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do the bad breath. I couldn't do the bad breath. I'm just going to go with morning breath. I'm going to ex- accept morning breath. Fair. Okay. Morning breath it is. All right. Deb. Yes. Would you rather never be able to taste food again? Mm, that would be bad. Or would you rather have to make every meal for yourself for the rest of oh your God. life? Uh, I'd make every meal for myself for the rest. Of, I, I love, I just love food too much. Not taste f- good food, Kevin. You're going to go to Nobu in Malibu. Yeah. And you're going to bring Tupperware <laughs> and ask for a plate and plop out homemade whatever yep. while everybody going to take my fork and take a bite of your nobu no 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 that was not made for you <laughs> you don't get to eat food that wasn't made for <gasps> by you kevin but under your circumstance it doesn't matter if it's nobu or me i can't taste it i don't care i would actually love the idea to never taste food again what it's totally freeing it's totally freeing i can eat anything oh, and everything one of life's greatest pleasures deb you have me And we hate cooking as much as we do right now. Imagine if it was just you. You could never go to Chipotle. You could never go go. to PJ's. No, you can't. I can go. I just can't eat. Okay. What's the point of going? But I can go and socialize and have fun and visit. Yeah. And then whip out your Tupperware. (laughs) I can eat before I go. Again, (laughs) that's the point. You can't not Cook for yourself. Oh, I don't know, Kevin. Never taste. I want people to vote on this one. I think this is a big deal. Okay, we can put that up on uh, Instagram stories. I, I I would go not 
taste. I'd, I say, could not cook for myself for the rest of my life. If I live to be 110 <laughs> years old, you're telling me that I have to cook for another 64 years? I mean, I, that's what I feel like it's or been for me. 74 uh, years. I mean, all women who've been cooking forever feel like that, I'm telling you. Um, but You feel like you cook all the time. And I told you the other day, I cooked five out week. of six yeah, days yeah. And, you're, and you're still exhausted. Um, the one good thing about not tasting yep. is like, I mean, give me a kale smoothie every morning. I'm. That's exactly what I'm saying. I would be the healthiest person in the world. You would eat all the good we stuff go for your vegan body like that. That's what I'm saying. Get on the no taste train. I don't know. I have to think about that. The no taste train, I believe, is where it's at. Uh, here's a good one. Would you rather, right now, today, have the appearance of when you were 25, mm-hmm. or would you rather today? have the wisdom at 85. So 20 more years of living, wisdom, or snap your fingers, you have your current wisdom, but you are you look like your 25-year-old self. Current wisdom, 25. <laughs> <laughs> you, you pride yourself on knowing things. You wouldn't want an extra 20 years of knowledge at the snap of a finger? What if dementia had set in? What if I started No, that's, this things? isn't like a monkey's paw thing where I'm like, <laughs> oh yeah, 20 years down the road, you're just like trapped in your brain. So, like, you live 20 years, you know more now than you did at your current age. Yeah. And you just automatically obtain that. So by the time you actually live to be 85, you're operating at 105 years of information. But I... How do I look? 85? No, you like look like yourself. I no, look like no, myself No, you just right are now. yourself. Myse- today. Right. So in the, one, in the one option, you look 25, but you have the mind and wisdom of yourself today. Yeah. In the other option, you look like yourself today, but you have the mind and the wisdom of somebody who has lived 20 years longer than you. You're, you're 20 yourself in the future. Mm. Your future self. Yeah. You know... <sighs> You probably, I mean, probably have to go for the wisdom. I mean, truth be told. Don't let, don't let me sway you either way. No, 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 no. Be vain. Uh, I, it just would be, here's the thing. I think most women look back at their younger selves physically and you, we can just, in that time we picked ourselves apart, right? Mm-hmm. And we're very critical. Now we look back at our younger selves and go like, man, you were fine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so it would be so great to go back and just be you exactly as you were and have that experience of, Oh, I am fine. Mm. I am great. And at 65 genuinely appreciate yourself yes, at 25. Exactly. That's and, fair. Every, and everything a 25 year old can do physically and yep. you know, all of that. Yeah. Last one. I think this is a good one. Would you rather be a contestant on survivor? Yeah. Or have a reoccurring yet not starring role on one of the Bravo Housewives franchises. So you're not one of the main ones. Yeah. You're not like holding the apple. You don't have like a quippy little intro. You're the one who comes in. You're like the rational one. Like you come on screen and people are like, oh, thank God it's Deb. She's going to talk some sense into these idiots. Or you can be a contestant on Survivor. Okay. So truly, I would. Rather be a contestant on Survivor. As you are today. Well, that, no, and this is what I was going to say. Therein lies the problem. <laughs> <laughs> There's, I couldn't do most, a lot of those things. All right, Deb, go to the sit-up bench. <laughs> <laughs> or, <laughs> you can only sit out every other thing, right? Yeah. Um, Let's get some floaties on Deb, please. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, like, what was that thing that we saw them teetering? Like, I mean, like. Oh, the balance stuff. The, the balance stuff would be bad over the water. Yeah, like I mean, like I couldn't do that. I mean, I there's so much of that I couldn't do. But I think the experience of Survivor would just be the grandest experience. Here's the thing about the whole housewife stuff. Yeah, like honest to God, the conversations, the issues, the I mean. It would just kill me. I, w- I would want to flip tables just because. But that doesn't come on you. You get to be the voice of reason. Do I get to be the one that sits at the table and rolls my eyes? Yeah. Oh, okay. You get to be the one that they're all kind of vying for. Like, yeah. no, she's crazy. No, she's crazy. Deb, who's the craziest? And you're, you're like, all well, crazy? both of you are actually pretty crazy. Yeah. No, no. That, but I also, too, I don't have a brand. <laughs> True. But if I had a brand, I think my brand would rather go to Survivor than go to one of the housewife shows. True, but you could grow the brand on the housewife show. Ugh. If you, how long do you think, at current day, Deb, how long do you think you would last on Survivor? <laughs> 
well, I'm really nice. Yeah. And I can cook. True. I can make something out of nothing. If they, if they didn't do one of those, hey, we're all here. We're 10 minutes into the episode. Vote somebody off. If that wasn't one of the things, how many days do you think you could last on Survivor? When is the merge? It's anywhere between 13 to 8 people. We've seen that number. Okay. I believe I could finagle myself to the merge. Really? Unless. Here's my unless. Unless I would. You know how we saw where that one team lost every yes. single. Then, you know, the people that are older get right away sure but if it was just normal yeah i think i could ingratiate myself by working hard around the camp making everybody feel lovely yeah doing a good because i even say to you like why don't they grab those crabs and throw those in there do you right. mean like i think i could make food and keep people upbeat right um and i think i know like when to make a move and when not to make a move yep um but then when it got to individual immunity oh man i would say the Clearly the toughest part for you would be the physical aspect. Right, right. You, camp life, you would be exceptional because you would know you needed to be exceptional. Right, right. And, and strategic gameplay, it'd be God tier stuff. People would have no earthly idea where any of, where any of this like um, manipulation was coming from because Deb's just adding crabs to the rice. <laughs> Meanwhile, she's like undercutting everybody. I would say... I think you would make nine days before they just nine. said, before they said she's the nicest woman in the world. We don't know what we're really going to do without her at, when it comes to cooking, but she is a physical liability <laughs> on the challenges. <laughs> is she still stuck under that? We net? can't <laughs> carry both the raft and Deb for fear that she's going to drown. Is she stuck out there? Did she ever come back? Exactly. Right, yeah. Okay. That was, would you rather we will post, some of these, and you guys can tell us your opinions because I think there's are some really good would you rather's actually. Um, Deb, what are you thankful for this week? Mm. So this week, I am. Do you want to go first? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> nope. I'm waiting for you to go to oh. buy me more time, baby. Okay, that is terrible. That is terrible. We should have our thank yous all ready to go, it's shouldn't true. we? It's true. Um, this week, I am thankful we got some, uh, this week we got some news that might be, which we're not going to share right now, but which could, could seem challenging, I'm yep. just going to say. And I just uh, am astounded at how everybody involved has been remarkably upbeat. Yep. You know, there's that moment when you hear the news that you got, feel like you got hit by a bat. Yep. Um but I feel like very quickly, so fast almost that it was unbelievable to me. Everybody regained themselves, got right on, you know, what they needed to do. And it's actually been, I'm going to say, pleasant and funny and optimistic and okay sense. So I am very grateful for the fast bounce back. For those of you who have listened a lot, you know, Diet Coke drives are important to Deb and I. Yes. So to understand the emotion of the day we went on a diet coke drive and we got french fries large each so that'll tell you the the, yeah. the type of day it was yeah um that's great clearly if you weren't going to use that i was going to use that because great minds think alike so i'm just going to go super duper superficial and i ordered a body pillow that i am so excited to use tonight so tell people that because this is really pretty funny you've had lower back pain so For like a year, I'm unwilling to say that my lower back pain is because I'm just getting older. Right. I don't believe that. Well, because you're in great shape. I'm in great shape, humble. <laughs> and I know I'm just six foot seven. The world is not meant for me. Right. So I have lower back pain. So one of the things every chiropractor, um, acupuncturist, acupuncturist has said, physical therapist, sleeping on your stomach is bad. Don't sleep on your stomach, sleep on your side or sleep on your back. And I said, how do you stop yourself from doing something in your sleep? And they said, tuck a pillow between your legs. And so I did that. The problem is I thrash in my sleep. So the pillow goes God knows where. So then I bought a body pillow that's like, I don't know, six feet long. And hopefully just pin myself in that position to see if that will help with the lower back pain. So I'm excited to give that a try. Yeah, good luck. I hope that works. Thank you so much. I mean, it is pretty funny because you do sit up on, well, you did sit up in your bed a lot yep. in the morning and work. And 
when you quit doing that and started coming down here and working, you were like, oh, my back pain is way better. I'm, I'm yeah. willing to say that my posture is half of the reason. Like, yeah. but like my casual posture, standing up, I'm absolutely fine. But the sitting posture, the relaxing posture, I mean, there's a thousand memes that says like, why does my back hurt? And you're like, legs are above your head and you're, you know, your arms are crossed. Right. I'm hopeful that sleeping with a body pillow will cure or at least ease some of the lower back ailments. So we'll, we'll see. Good luck. Thank you. What is the intoxicating smell I smell coming from the kitchen right now? Because it is unlike anything that has perfumed this house before. We are having a miso chili ramen tonight. You showed this to me last night. Yep. And then you said you were going to make it. And I legit got excited. Uh, in fact, I said, I think I said I wanted to make it. What do you think about tomorrow night? Great. You were so excited, like your excitement, like was the driving force for me. And um, so there's, there is, of course, the ramen noodles and all the wonderful broth and all of that. Yep. And then there is a chicken breast on top, you know, diced up. Yep. There is, I'm going to say a semi soft hard boiled egg. Yep. Um, green onions, jalapenos, black sesames. We'll take a picture. It looks, it looks amazing. And I will say this. The broth was fabulous. It smells phenomenal. It's yeah. when you are used to smells in your house and it's something new and different. The smell is almost better than anything else that it's going to taste like. Cause you're like, Oh, this is new. This is great. I'm only familiar with this when I go out to eat. So the fact that it exists in this house almost makes it better than the fact that it's going to taste yeah. delicious. Cause it will. And I there will be you. leftovers. Oh my God. Yeah. Amazing. Utterly amazing. So excited. Anything else? No. Then that's going to do it for us this week on the Deb and Kev podcast. Remember to like, rate, and review wherever you listen to us and follow us on all of our social channels. And you can see us and you can play along with Would You Rather on our YouTube channel. I know there's more than three people that watch this. There's at least four people that watch this. Okay, let's go with four. I want to say there's like we get an average of 13 people that watch this. Is that true? Yeah. Maybe some are bots. Okay. Maybe some are from India. I don't really know. But we should come up with a clever nickname for these people because eventually it's going to explode. And we want the people who watch now to know that they were the founding members of the fill in the blank audience name. Founding members. Come up with a name that you want to be called. Let yes. us know in the YouTube comments what yes. you want us to refer to you as. And then that will be your trademark. And when we strike it rich and become famous. We're not going to give you any of that money, but we're going to let you feel good that you came up with your own name. But we will let you have a voice about segments. We'll bring you into a little inner circle. Yeah, we will. I promise you, I will. Deb will let you tell her what you want, and then I'll yeah. just probably veto it. That's going to do it for us, guys. Have a wonderful week. We will see you Thursday. Deb, I love you so much. I love you, baby. See you guys. Thank you for listening to the Deb and Kev podcast. Remember to like and subscribe wherever you listen to this podcast. Follow Deb and Kev on Facebook and on Instagram and Twitter at Deb and Kev Pod.